Welcome to our Wednesday night Bible study here at Dynamic Life. Thank you for being here live, and thank you for tuning in by our Facebook live stream. If you could not make it out tonight, uh, we know it is raining, but we thank you for the fact that you uh, were here to learn and to honor the Lord by your presence, and we always appreciate that. We never take that for granted. Uh, by the way, um, those of you who know me and have been coming here for years know that <clears throat> I'm always studying, I'm always listening to sermons because uh, I'm a glutton for information, I want to learn, I want to grow. Um, part of my my routine uh, is I go to the gym every morning, uh, first thing, uh, but while I'm at the gym I have my headphones on and I'm listening to messages on oneplace.com, I'm listening to Alistair Begg, I'm listening to John MacArthur, I'm listening to Tony Evans, I'm listening to... Martin Lord Jones, some of you may not know who he is, but uh, I'm just, I, that's my routine for the first hour or so that I'm at the gym is I'm always listening to messages. That's my devotional time, uh, part of my prayer time. And I've been listening to um, John MacArthur and Alistair Bay quite a bit here the last two weeks. Uh, John MacArthur is doing a series that's very um, complimentary with what we're doing on Sundays. Okay. Uh, talking about the portrait uh, of the Christian life. Uh, so I would encourage you to go back and listen to those messages. I will give you insights and nuances that you have heard from me, but also will add something to uh, what you have heard here. Uh, Alistair Begg has really been doing a um, very convicting uh, series on the Ten Commandments. Um, uh, if you thought you understood the Ten Commandments, you don't understand the Ten Commandments. Uh, I would challenge you to go back and listen to his series on the Ten Commandments. He has a book called Pathway that is in line with what he's teaching, uh, but he's been talking about each one of the commandments, and um, each one of them have been uh, very convincing and convicting um, uh, all at the same time. Uh, the one he did today and yesterday on um, the Sabbath day, um, uh, we all, I, 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 I was on the treadmill and I wanted to get off and just get on the floor uh, <laughs> because we, we, have, we are doing a great injustice to God the way that we do not, um, in the principle that the Sabbath day should be understood, which leads to the proper practice, we, we are in America and our American churches uh, are just violating that commandment left and right. Mm -hmm. uh, but if you violate the other three, you're going to violate that one. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're making unto yourself uh, images and, and calling them God or saying this is what I think God is or or as, as I feel God is, or, this is what I think God would do, then you're violating that commandment. And if you have other gods and they're, and, and they're you got other gods and he's not the only God, you're violating that commandment. And if you have any other gods that are before him, you're violating that commandment. So you are probably, if you start off wrong on the first one, you're probably wrong on the other nine. Uh, and, and it's not about legalism. It's not about this is how we earn righteousness or how we get right with God. It is, it is God's guidelines, if you will. There's God's boundaries for how to live the best life. That's what the Ten Commandments really are. And what they show you is that you can't live the best life apart from Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. And so the Ten Commandments should drive you to the cross. But having come to the cross doesn't mean you don't live out the principles of what the Ten Commandments stand for. Mm -hmm. uh, some would say, well, the Ten Commandments are no longer needed. The Ten Commandments are not for the church. Well, yes, they are. Yes, they are. Uh, because it is the epitome, it is the um, written picture, if you will, while Jesus is the physical picture, the, the Ten Commandments are the written picture of what a life that is lived that pleases God looks like. And so we're still supposed to do that uh, based on what we're learning in Colossians and what you learn really throughout the scriptures. We're, we're still to live a life, live life in a way that pleases God. <laughs> But you don't know what that is if you don't know what God says pleases him. And so while we all fall short, we all don't measure up, it is the direction we should be striving for. It is what we're aiming at. You may not hear the bullseye, but you know what you're aiming at. 
Uh, and it's not about perfection, as you learned here. It's about are you being perfected? Because none of us are perfect. So we don't even allow you to use that car here. You just take that up, tear it up, burn it up. It don't play here. Because it's not about whether you're perfect or not, because we know no one's perfect, but are you being perfected? And what does being perfected look like? And that's what Colossians is telling us, and this is what this passion Ephesians also reminds us of, is that we are not what we used to be. So therefore, you can't live how you used to live before Christ or God chose you. Amen. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Amen. New creation leads to new behavior. Amen. And, and you're a new creation, according to 2 Corinthians 5.17. We all know that text, and we quote that text, but we don't understand that text. You are a new creation. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things. Behold, all things have become new. Therefore, the new you has to look like the new creation. Therefore, you can't look like the old creation calling yourself a new you. you know, and many of us, and people love to say, well, you, 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 you can't read my heart. You are absolutely correct. I cannot crawl up inside you, and neither can anybody else, and look at what's inside of you. But according to Ephesians 4, and according to Colossians chapter 3, the new you that's on the inside must be manifested on the outside. So I shouldn't have to crawl up inside of you. <laughs> you don't know my heart. I know if you have a new heart, if your lifestyle reflects the attributes and virtues and characteristics of a new heart. Because you are a new creation, there must be new behavior. New values, new goals, new agendas, new... Okay, and so this is what Ephesians chapter four says, and this is important. This is an important study based on our Wednesday night subject of a theological perspective of the city. And John MacArthur touched on this today in his message. Our cities are not the way they are because the city is bad, mm -hmm. or because the city is inherently evil. That's what some people believe. That's why people run and live in the suburbs and in the country. Because they think the country is cleaner than the city. <laughs> well, it might be cleaner because there's not a lot of smog and cars and fumes and big buildings. But sin is sin wherever you go. Mm -hmm. And wherever you got people, sin will show up. Mm -hmm. So it's not an environment that makes a person sinful. It's the mindset of the person. It's the mind. And John MacArthur quoted a study today that the, the justice system, the criminal system is doing, and they're just not coming to the, the conclusion and the realization it's not a person's environment that makes them bad and act the way they do, it's how they think. <clears throat> but as a man is, or as a man thinketh, that's what he is. So we can never get ourselves right if we don't have a renewed mind. Amen. Listen, you can't do renewed behavior if you don't have a renewed mind. Mm -hmm. And you don't have a renewed mind if you haven't been renewed inwardly by the new birth. Amen. So it's not the environment that people need to change. It's the inward man that needs to be changed. And the church has lost this message because we are buying into the sociology and psychology and all the other theologies of the culture. And we don't start with theology, which is the sound doctrine and sound teachings of the scriptures. We don't do that here. The word of God sits on the throne of all our thought processes and all our understanding. And we start with what God says. We don't start with what man thinks because man lives in the futility of his mind. Amen. And it's corrupt. Amen. All right? So let me prove that to you from the scriptures. 
Look at Ephesians chapter 4, verse 17 and following. This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord. So Paul said, I didn't come up with this on my own. These are not my own thoughts. These are not my own words. This is not how I feel. This ain't how I was raised. This is not even what I was taught in some school. He says, this I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord, that you should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk. When we talk, when you see the word walk in the Bible, it means this should no longer be your lifestyle. This should no longer be your manner of behavior. This should no longer be the path that you are traveling. And how do the Gentiles walk? And Gentiles is a euphemism for people who are unsaved. Not a part of the common wealth of God. Not a part of, don't follow the God of Israel. Okay? And all of us who aren't Jews were Gentiles. In an ethnic sense, but in a spiritual sense, you're either a follower of the God of Israel or you're not. Jews were the followers of the God of Israel, Yahweh, Jehovah, Adonai, but the Gentiles were the followers of pagan gods. So how did they walk? How did they live? And how do we no longer live? Okay. Now, let me read it how we usually say it. Because we say it different than how the Bible says it. <laughs> because some of us, I don't know your heart, but I can tell by the words that come out your mouth and your behavior, are walking in the fertility of our minds. Watch this. This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord that you should no longer walk. We say we should no longer try to walk. I'm no longer supposed to walk, but no, no. You should no longer walk because the no longer walking is based on what God has done all the way up to this point from chapter 1 to this point of the section of the scripture. So the therefore, you know, those who are Bible students, whenever you see the word therefore, you ask, what is it therefore? Well, everything that precedes this leads up to why he can say what he's saying right now. Okay? And we won't go back and, and, and go through all that, but you, you, you can read that on your own. We no longer walk like the Gentiles who walk in the fertility of their mind. In the fertility of their mind. What I feel, what I think, what I think is right. What I think the purpose of my life is. That's the futility of their mind. It's emptiness. It, 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 it's not right. It's not in line with how God thinks or what God says. That's the futility of your mind. It's emptiness. It's corruptness. Now, if people have corrupt minds, why do you expect good behavior? <laughs> you say, Pastor? Is that what we really expect? Yes, you do. You expect people to act better than what they really are. But when it comes to you, how you're supposed to act, you don't expect yourself to act better than what you really are. Because if you didn't expect people to act better than what they really are, you wouldn't get frustrated and angry at people when they didn't do and act the way that you think they should act. But when you don't act the way you're supposed to act, you want mercy, kindness, and grace. Because you're walking in the fertility of your mind. Because we're saying, don't do to me what I do to you. Do better to me than what I deserve. Is anybody with me? I, I know y'all don't think that. I'm talking about the people out there in the street. I ain't talking about the people in the room. Y'all don't, don't do this. I'm talking about the people out there. <laughs> And, and we, we sit and watch shows and listen to music that contribute to the fertility of our mind. Mm -hmm. no, nothing's no longer crass to us. Nothing's no longer coarse joking. No, no, nothing's no longer slander and nothing's no longer anger and bitterness and wrath. It's just a show. Mm -hmm. It's not sexual immorality anymore. It's just a lifestyle choice. 
And everybody has the right to choose their own. Yes, if you're walking the fertility of your mind. Yes, you do. But if you're walking according to the God of Israel, you're walking according to the new mind, the new person, the new man. You're to put off that and put on the new. And that's something you have to do. Let me let me tell you something you may not know. I, I, I don't know. I don't, I don't want to assume you know this. It's very basic kindergarten stuff. They do make remote controls with off buttons. <laughs> I, 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 Pastor, you can't help but see all that CN. It's all over the TV. I got news for you. There is an off button on the TV and your remote control. <laughs> I know nobody's ever told you that. I know that's new to you. That's, that's, really? Your radio does have an off button. I know you never turn it off in your car. I don't know. I know you don't even know where it is. When you bought it, it was on, and it's been on ever since. <laughs> you have got to turn some of that stuff off. You have got to change the station. But you know why we don't change the station? Because we like the old stuff. We don't like the new. Pastor Clay, that's why we come to church to hear you on Sunday. To give us what we need. That's good made for two hours on Sunday, but the devil's working on you all week, and your flesh is working on you all week, and this world system is bombarding you all week. That two hours on Sunday is not going to help you all week. You yourselves, those of you who have been here, you yourselves must put off and you yourself must put on. Don't call me to come put off your old clothes and put on your new clothes. <laughs> Don't call another believer and say, help me get spiritually dressed. No, you must put off and you must And as I said in the sermon, don't go stand in front of your closet. Hey, go stand in front of your closet and say, I just really feel like changing clothes. Clothes be changed. <laughs> <laughs> and expect something to come off the rack and jump on you. <laughs> clothes be off. And, and your clothes, it don't work that way. You must put them off. Is anybody with me? Amen. You know, life can be really funny when you stop and think about it. We we just silly. Mm -hmm. We're just silly. Because that's how some people think. Mm -hmm. God, I know I shouldn't be doing that. Make me do right. God said, No, you put off. Mm -hmm. And then you put on. Mm -hmm. And then I'll empower you into putting off and putting on, but don't expect me to change your clothes for you. See, you, you're walking in the fertility of your mind. Having their understanding, verse 18, darkened. Now, if you have fertility of mind, empties of mind, if you can't discern truth in your mind, then you're walking in darkness. You can't be walking in the light. And all of us were born this way, outside of Christ. All of us came into the world just like this. This was your condition before you were born again. And if you understand that was your condition before you were born again, why are you getting mad at people whose condition are like that and not sharing the good news so they can come out of that condition? Mm -hmm. Right? right. Mm -hmm. Having to understand, being what? Alienated from the life of God. They are separated from God. Now, why do you expect people, expect people who are separate from God to live like God would want them to live? <laughs> but see, they don't believe they're separated from God. Romans chapter 5 says we were enemies with God. But people don't believe that God is their enemy. God loves everybody. Yes, he does, but you're still his enemy. God shows grace on the saved, unsaved, and the saved. Yes, he does. But you're still his enemy. You are alien. You are separated. Paul talks about this earlier in Ephesians chapter 4 when he talks about the Gentiles who were separated from the commonwealth of Israel. They had no allegiance. They had no connection. They had no covenant with the God of Israel. That's true for every sinner. 
They're alienated. They're separated from God. Because of the ignorance that is in them. Isn't that an oxymoron right there? I know y'all don't know what oxymoron means. Look it up. But it's a contradiction. They think they are the most intelligent people on God's earth, and God says they're the most ignorant people on earth. They got PhDs and DDDs and MVDs and SUVs and and they sit on television and they pontificate. They have diarrhea of the mouth and they just talk and talk and talk as if they really are talking and they know what they're talking about. God says no. In that state, in that unsafe state, ignorance is in them. Now it doesn't mean they don't know certain things about certain things. But when it comes to this issue, what the real problem is, what the real need is, they're ignorant. And somebody got to go turn on the light. But don't expect them to shake your hand. They might nail you to a cross. They might throw you in jail. They might pick up stones and stone you to death. but they'll never get light if we don't go. They'll never, never know what truth is if we don't tell them the truth. This is the problem with our cities. This is why the government can't get things right. This is why you can't have enough policemen and National Guard and laws in the land. Because none of those will fix these issues. Only salvation. Amen. Only being born again. Only a new life. Because of the ignorance that is in them, let me say this. Romans tells us that in every man's conscience, every woman's conscience, who has ever been born, the moral law of God is in their conscience. In other words, they know right from wrong. But only the born-again people have the law of God written on their hearts. Oh, that was a word for price of coming in. <laughs> Everybody knows the moral law of God. Everybody. You can go to the darkest depths of any country, backwoods, and people have guidelines of right and wrong. But only God's children, only God's people have the law of God written on their new hearts. Mm -hmm. There's a difference. Because you can grieve your conscience. Mm -hmm. You can sear your conscience. <laughs> but for those of us who have the law of God written on our hearts, that law is constantly there. Pricking us. Challenging us. Shaping us. Molding us. Wooing us. Calling us. Convincing us, convicting us, changing us. But everybody knows right from wrong. But you can get so corrupt. You can become Romans 1, 18 and following. You can get to the point where God, you reject God so much, he turns you over to a depraved mind. And in that text, he turns you over three to four times, and you're only hopeless. This is the people who live around you. These are the people you have to work among. This, this is who you're really hearing about on the news. <laughs> this is why they do what they do and act how they act and think how they think and behave how they behave. Because of their blindness of their heart, who being past feelings, see? You, you notice it gets worse and worse? They're past feeling. They, 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 they take from people their physical bodies and cast them aside and don't even care what they did. 
because they're past feeling. They go in and shoot up a whole school of grade school children and it doesn't even bother them because they're past feeling. They sit on a man's neck in the middle of the street with cameras rolling. And he says he can't breathe and they do not move because they're past feeling. Ain't got nothing to do with black and white. It's got to do with the fact that person is past feeling his conscience. But that's what it is to be sinful. And there's no march. There's no protest. There's no store you can break in and loot. They can fix this problem. People need the gospel. Amen. People need the church to do what the church is supposed to be doing and not join the secular world in their agenda. Using human methods to fight spiritual issues. And if the church don't do it, there is no plan B. If Christians don't do it, there's no plan B. If we don't go into all the world and make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, teaching them to deserve all things that God has said in the power of the Holy Spirit, there is no plan B. Who be in past feeling, verse 19, have given themselves over to lewdness. In the Greek, the Greek word means that, that, is, that is the most atrocious, degrading form that you can be in. I mean, sin has just gone wild. Corruption has just, has no boundaries. Immorality has no boundaries. The sin you can do, you do it at a million miles an hour if you could. To work all uncleanness with greediness. More and more and more and more. Because now you have an insatiable appetite that cannot be satisfied for corruption and sin and lewdness and uncleanliness. Listen. If you didn't go to this level while you were unsaved, it was by the grace of God that you did. Amen. Because everybody has the same potential. Amen. Let me say that one more time. Everybody has the potential to go this far. Amen. Only the grace of God, even in the sinner's life, keeps all of us from going this far. Amen. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Amen. And then you get a city full of people like this? Amen. Oh, you can call one of the National Guard you want. You can vote whoever you want in the White House. It won't make no difference. Ah, verse 20. But. That's a good but. <laughs> but you have not so learned Christ. Is there supposed to be a difference, y'all? Yes. Yes. The, the people who have not learned Christ... This is the way they act. But those who have learned Christ, this is how you act. But we think we can mention back to behavior and still have Christ. It's that old, old uh, TV show with Donnie Marie. She, she's a little bit country. He's a little bit rock and roll. <laughs> I'm a little bit old. I'm a little bit new. No, you're not. No, you're not. You're either one or the other. But you have not learned, so learn Christ. If indeed you have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus. Have you really met Jesus? Have you really learned about him? If you have, what are you doing over there? What are you doing acting like that? What am I doing acting like that? What am I doing living like that? If I've met Christ, and if I've met Christ, he hasn't taught me to live like that. You don't look at Christ's life and come out with verse 17 to 19. Yeah, but if I look at Peter, I can get some of that. Well, you ain't supposed to be looking at Peter. 
If I look at Paul, I can get you ain't supposed to be looking at Paul. The text says, what's the text said? But you have not so learned. Oh, I don't want Jesus to be an example because I can't live up to that. No one ever asked you to. You're not even supposed to. You can't. But Paul gives you the key in Galatians 2.20. Hold your finger here and go to Galatians 2.20. You there with me? Galatians mm -hmm. 2.20 says, I have been crucified with Christ. <laughs> it is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. See, that's, that's part of our problem. We try to live a life we can't live. No, you're crucified with Christ. You no longer live, but you live because Christ now lives in and through you. So the question is not, can you live the life? Here's the question. Look at me. Come close. Can Christ live the life? And if Christ can live the life, and he's living the life in you, can you live the life? Amen. Amen. Oh, pastor, that's why we don't come to these Bible studies. Yeah. You take away all our excuses. You take away all that junk that we thought we knew and understood, and you and you just give us the Bible. Well, what else you want? Any good shepherd should give you the Bible. Amen. <clears throat> yes, we struggle. Yes, we battle. Yes, we do war. But we still got to come back to the book. If indeed you have learned him and have been, I'm back in Ephesians, I'm sorry, verse 21. You can read 2.20 of Galatians on your own. If indeed you have been have, have heard him and been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus, that you what? Yeah. Who's the you? Put your name in there. Put your name in there. That victory put off concerning your former conduct. What's the former conduct? Verse 17 to 19. Now, if you put off the former conduct, how are you still living in what you put off? Because you took it back off. Huh? Because you took it back off. Either you never took it off, uh -huh. or you put it back on. Uh -huh. You know any people who keep putting stuff off and then put it right back on? Mm -hmm. Sunday morning, they put it off. You hear them on Monday on Facebook and on the internet, and they done put it right back on. <laughs> and they live a life of a yo-yo. <laughs> <laughs> up and down. Up and down. Spin. Come back up. Spin. I'm done. I'm, I got it. I, I was good today. But two, next day, they right back up, up and down, up and down. Because they don't put it off and keep it off. Or they put it off and they don't get dressed in the corresponding garb that contradicts what they just took off. Watch it. Put off concerning your former conduct, the old man, which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lusts, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind that you may put on the new man which was created according to God. Uh -oh. Who created the new man? God. God ever make anything that don't work? No. Then how's the new man not working in us? If I send you to outer space and I give you the suit <laughs> that is conditioned for outer space, How are you not able to breathe and walk in space? I gave you a suit and put you in a ship that I created, God says, that is fitting for where I'm sending you. You get into space and you sputtering and spitting trying to breathe Tell me I got the suit on. No, you don't. 
because the suit was made by the creator so you could breathe in space so you wouldn't what? Be gasping for air. So how are we gasping to live like Christ when God gave us clothes so we could be like Christ? Yeah, but this world is so sinful. But the clothes are made for you to live in that environment. Oh, y'all ain't praying with me. <laughs> Put on the new man which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. Brothers and sisters, this is the problem of our world. This is the problem of our city. This is the problems of our community. This is the problem of our churches. So now we're ready for the study tonight. <laughs> we have the notes. Because what I want you to understand is, is that the problem is theological first. And the theological has to address the sociological, psychological, physiological, and all of other logical issues. Are you with me? Are you with me? If we had more Christians like this, then we could address the issues of our community mm -hmm. better. If we had more Christian homes like this, we could address the issues of our community and our school system better. It's never going to be perfect. You'll never have heaven on earth. But there ought to be some heavenly beings on earth. Colossians chapter 3, verse 1 through 4. Set your mind on things that are above. Seek the things that are above where Christ is seated and not the things that are below where he's not. The Apostle Paul only went to cities. Paul understood why he was here. Paul understood why Jesus saved him in Acts chapter 9 on the Damascus Road. God, Christ gave Paul his marching orders and told him, this is what you're going to spend the rest of your born again life doing. And here's what you will encounter as a result of doing it. Do you know he's told the church that also? Do you know he's told each Christian that also? Ephesians chapter 2 says, in verse 10, I do believe, says, we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works that he ordained before creation. What do you mean you don't know what you're supposed to be doing? What do you mean you don't know what your purpose is? You are his workmanship. That word workmanship in the Greek means you are his poem. You are his written poem. When people read you, they should come out with the gospel. You are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for what? Good work. Then he has preordained before the beginning of time. I don't know what God wants me to do. Wait a minute. He came up with it before the beginning of time, before you were ever born again. What do you mean you don't know what he wants you to do? It's in the book. It's in the book. And the pastor's job, the gifted men's job, according to Ephesians chapter 4, starting with verse 11, is to equip the saints to do that work. Amen. We can't get people in the church do work. Because Sunday is no longer God's day. Well, if Sunday is no longer God's day, the Lord's day, New Covenant, Sabbath Day, Old Covenant, if it's no longer the Lord's Day, then you're not you're violating the other three commandments that came before that one. Mm -hmm. Wow. Mm -hmm. Amen. The Apostle Paul only went to cities, and it seems he never approached any city the same way twice. He custom made his approach. Today we call this contextualization. 
The big word just simply means you understand, you exegete, you study the culture, and then you line up a plan that is based on the word of God to address the issues of that culture. How are you going to make disciples? How are you going to present the gospel? How are you going to develop people who follow Christ? And one size strategy doesn't fit all. Paul was a master at this. But he was gifted by God to do it. He varied the three M's. The three M's are important. Message, meeting place, and methodology. Message, meeting place, and methodology. If you study Peter's message, his presentation of the gospel on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, and then you correlate that with Paul's message to the pagans in Acts 17, they don't start in the same place and they don't have the same uh, nuances to them. Why? Because the audiences are different. In Acts chapter 2, Peter's preaching to what? Jews. So he takes them back all the way and comes down to their whole Jewish history and basically says that this is the sermon. Y'all killed the Messiah. <laughs> That's the sermon. You killed the prophets in the Old Testament and you killed the Messiah. That was his message. Now how people get saved about a message like that? <laughs> But the text says, and they were what? Cut to the heart. Because the message that should be preached to that audience is now being empowered by the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is working with the message on the heart of those who are receiving the message. And they are, they are cut to the heart. And here, 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 here's the thing. What must we do? I would love that on Sunday morning. <laughs> Pastor, we just heard what you said. What must we do? It'd be great if they're not given invitation. We got to give invitations. Every head bow, every eye closed. I believe the Lord has been working on somebody's heart. <laughs> if you believe that you're not in line with the Lord and you need you want a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ because you understand you're a sinner, would you please signify by raising your hand? They didn't do that. It was the unsaved people who said, we heard what you said. We are convicted and convinced because the Holy Spirit has worked in our hearts. What do we need to do to get out of this condition? But in Acts 17, Paul is speaking and preaching to a pagan army who know nothing about Jewish history. So why would you give Jewish history to people who know nothing about Jewish history? So his message is different than Peter's message. He's walking through the city. Paul had just led a great revival in Philippi. He was really on a personal holiday. He decided, I'm going to go to Vegas. <laughs> Athens was a lot like Vegas. And he's just walking up down the street. He's seeing all these buildings, and he's seeing all these, these statues, and, and, and there's this God, it's, it's Zeus, it's Aphrodite, it's uh, Ametrius, it's Demetrius, it's, it's Pluto, it's Mars. And the text says that he was pricked in his heart. What in the world is this? But then he came to a statue that said, to the unknown God. Because pagans aren't dumb. Pagan says, we know these gods, but there might be some gods we don't know, so, so we don't offend those gods, we're going to have a statue that covers all the other gods. <laughs> and Paul takes that statue to the unknown god and talks about the god of Israel. Mm -hmm. He is the creator god. He is the sustaining god. And he is the judge that all you will have to face. See, that's a message for pagans. You don't give them what Peter gave up at the Jerusalem or Jews in Acts chapter 2. They don't have a Jewish history. He's the creator, he's the sustainer, and he's the judge, and you're going to have to deal with him one day. 
And they followed Paul and said, hmm, we, we heard what you said, but we need to hear more. See, y'all gone after the benediction. Peeled out the parking lot, left black marks in the parking lot, gone. <laughs> well, we, we would hear more. So the philosophers and the stories come along, the, 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 the intellectuals of the day, and they, he meets them on Mars Hill, and he, and he begins to share some more. And there were three results. Some mock, some grinding their teeth, some got saved. Four. And some says we need to hear more. Just nobody left not impacted or affected. Mm -hmm. Nobody said, Paul, that was a great message. I really enjoyed that, Paul. Appreciate you sharing that with us this morning, Pastor. They either hated what he said they either wanted to hear more about what he had to say. They either wanted to pick up stones and stone him. Or they got saved. We leave here. And y'all wipe down the pew. <laughs> and nobody ever said, what must we do? Pastor. I was convicted by that. And I want to repent. Mm -hmm. Pastor, I heard what you said. Can I get a little bit more? Can we have a brown bag? Mm -hmm. So I can get a little bit more. I would even love you to pick up the stone and want to hit me with. <laughs> At least I know something happened. <laughs> <laughs> I would even like it if you grind your teeth. Well, some of y'all do do that. <laughs> you just don't know I see you doing it while you're sitting in the pew. But let me tell you what people didn't do. Nobody fell asleep. Nobody checked their phone. Nobody left unimpacted. This is how far we have fallen in the modern day church of God. People live totally unimpacted. did not happen when the Holy Spirit was working. Now, I learned something about pastor and preaching. All I can do is make sure I'm properly prepared in a way that the Holy Spirit can work through me. But if you don't come properly prepared, that's on you. Mm -hmm. It's not the message that's ever the problem if the message is biblical. It's not the messenger if the messenger is properly prepared. But the audience can be unprepared and nothing happen. Yeah. Listen. People who are unsaved, when they come up in here on Wednesday or Sunday, whatever the word of God is going, going for may not like what they hear. But they are the leader of saying, God is up in that place. Mm -hmm. right. In the Old Testament, it was no question when God showed up. Something shook, the cloud got, the sky got dark, and thunder happened. Mm -hmm. Are we coming prepared before the Lord in such a way that even when sinners come up in here, they can say God is up in that place. Is our music so God and Christ oriented? They have to say God is up in that place. Is the attention and the reverence and the, and the vitality which we sing and worship so intense? People have to say God is up in that place. That's not all on the pastoral staff. Mm -hmm. That's on each and every one of us mm -hmm. who are sitting in those pews. Mm -hmm. Message, meeting place. He varied the meeting place. Sometimes they would meet in houses. Sometimes they would meet 
uh, uh, by the river with Lydia and some of the others, uh, rich women. He would uh, meet in the synagogue. He would meet in various places and use various methodologies to better reach the different audiences of those cities. We can say Paul contextualized his ministry approach to each city. Stephen Neal, the late missionary historian, once wrote that the early church was fortunate to have Paul as the architect of the mission strategy because he was bilingual, bicultural, from the Pharisee city of Tarsus and educated primarily in Jerusalem. Listen. Men need to go and prepare themselves to do what God has called them to do. Paul went to school. Why do you not need to go to school? And I'm not saying school is the end all and be all, but God ain't never filled an empty head mm -hmm. nor an empty heart. Paul went to school. And Paul was more educated than any of us before he went to school to learn about the things of God. Spoke more, spoke more languages than any of us. Mm -hmm. Knew the Pharisaical law better than any of us. Right. Was a Pharisee of the Pharisees. Hebrew of the Hebrews. Well trained, well versed in different dialects and languages. Before three years on the backside of the desert, he went to school. Because he didn't understand the mystery of the church that God was going to use him to proclaim according to Ephesians chapter 4. I don't understand people don't want to go to school. Don't want to read. Don't want to study. But they want to get up and say stuff that God never even said. <laughs> well, the spirit. <coughs> which, which spirit? There's two of them. Which one? Which one? I, I don't get it. He was a metropolitan man, E.M. Blaylock. Well, I do get it, but I, I won't go into what I get. But. In the book of Cities, the New Testament says, Paul followed the contours of urbanized Roman Empire. I suggest you read Acts 15 and 19, where you really get a sense of Paul's urban ministry. And you'll see that in Acts 16, Philippi, in Acts 17, Athens, Acts 18, Corinth, in Acts 19, Ephesus. And in each of these big cities, he spoke to a different kind of audience using a different approach. He became all things, all people, without compromising who he was in Christ. And without compromising the word of God. In Philippi, this, which was an upper class suburb, this was just on the background here. Philippi, which is an upper class suburb named, suburb named for Philippi Macedon. Some of you already know that. We taught that when we went through Revelation. The fall of Alexander the Great. Paul began evangelizing with a pre-existing prayer group led by Lydia. Ladies, mm -hmm. ladies, yeah. you have a place in the work of God. Mm -hmm. that. Ladies, mm -hmm. you play a vital role in the work of God. Yes, mm -hmm. they do. If it wasn't for ladies, most of our churches would be shut down tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Amen. <laughs> now you have a place, but stay in your place. Yes. <laughs> No woman has ever been called by God to be a pastor. Amen. Amen. Sorry. It is a role reserved only for men. I saw y'all look at me a little strange. Let me help you out. Let's go to First Timothy. Yeah. Yes, sir. One thing my mother always always said. God did, he, did, he didn't call women, but he didn't call every man either. That is correct. <laughs> I was going to deal with that when I got here. <laughs> don't deal with that. Just because you're a male, right. don't mean you qualify. Yeah. Okay. So not every man is called. Mm -hmm. So it actually not be surprising that women are not called. Mm -hmm. Everybody has a proper role in this proper place. Right. But unlike many fundamental conservative churches, women are not just to be seen and not heard. Right. You have a place. You just got to stay in your lane. Or lane. First Timothy chapter 3. This is a faithful saying. If a man desires the position of a bishop, elder or pastor, it's terms for all the same role. So, 
if a man desires the position of a bishop, he desires a good work. Now, you don't have to know no Greek. You don't have to know no Hebrew. You just got to know Sesame Street English. <laughs> the pronoun must always be reflective of the noun. Y'all with me? Mm -hmm. Let's read it again. This is a faithful saying. If a man, now, mankind. the question is, is it anthropos, meaning mankind, or is it a nair, which is the Greek word for male? How do we know? You look at the pronoun. If it was mankind, it would say they, or them. But the pronoun is masculine because the noun is masculine. If a man desires the position of a bishop, pastor, or elder, he desires a good work. Because the pronoun must always be reflected of the... All you need is Sesame Street English to figure that out. But that may not be enough. Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 14. Now, if you know your Bible, you know your background, correct. This church was a messed up church. Fleshly, carnal. Right? Uh, let me get the right text. Verse 34. We're talking about order in the church. Because Corinth, Corinth was a church that was what? Out of order. Okay? Let your women, what you about to say? I keep silence. Now, how you going to preach and you got to be silent? How you going to lead with authority and you got to be silent? Listen to this. Let your women keep silent. He's not talking about women can't talk in church, but when it comes to the role of the pastor, they can't have that. Because just like today, women in Corinth were trying to get into that role. That's why he's writing that. Because it's a problem in the church here, just like it's a problem in the church today. Watch this. Let the women keep silent in the churches, for they are not permitted to speak, but they are to be submissive, as the law also says. If they want to learn something, let them ask their husband. Not just their husband. Ask your own husband. Pastor Clay said, I'm not your husband. <laughs> Your husband needs to come get from Pastor Clay what he needs to take back to you. Ladies. Well, we got all single ladies in here right now. Okay. This one over here. Ladies, please do me a favor. Don't go home and beat your husband over the head with my sermon. <laughs> so he come back looking at me half crazy. <clears throat> If they want to learn something, let them ask their husband at home. Well, this assumes that what? The husband either knows what he needs to know or knows where to go get what he needs to know so he can lead his family. Every household has a pastor at home, and mister, that is you. Ladies, don't marry a man who don't know where he's going. Because if he don't know where he's going and you get yoked up with him, you ain't going to know where you're going. Amen. Well, I believe the Lord is going to use me to change him. Okay. <laughs> you have trouble changing yourself. Don't do it. Don't do it. Don't do it. If they want to learn something, let them ask their own husband at home, for it is shameful for women to speak in church. Women being rebellious and revolting in the church business meeting. No. Lean on to your husband. Ask him the question. If he don't know the answer, then he can ask the question. But wait a minute. Where's my independence? It's in submission. It's in submission. You are showing that you are one who is under what? Headship. Not because the man is better than you, it's because he has a different responsibility than you. Is anybody with me? Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. You see, this is why our, our communities are messed up because our homes are messed up. And our homes are messed up because our churches are messed up. Mm -hmm. Or did the word of God come originally from you, or was it was it you only that reached that it reached? That's some sarcasm. Don't tell me I ain't no sarcasm in the Bible. <laughs> but wait, wait. Did the word only come to you? God gave you some, some revelation he didn't give everybody else. This is sarcasm. If anyone thinks himself to be a prophet or spiritual, let him what? Acknowledge that the things which I write to you are commandments of the Lord. Paul said, I didn't make this up because of the culture. This is a commandment of the Lord. This doesn't change because you live in the 21st century or you live in America or Russia or Japan or Africa. This is a commandment of the Lord. But if anyone is ignorant, let him be ignorant. Therefore, brothers, desire earnestly to prophesy and do not forbid to speak with tongues. Let all things be done decently and what? And in order. And there's another section where he talks about it where he says, and I teach these things in every church. These same principles are taught in every church. So if they were taught in every church then, they're for every church now. Amen. Amen. Now you think this didn't get some people looking at Paul cross-eyed? <laughs> but we think the culture has changed, therefore the Bible must change to fit the culture. No. You must change to fit the Bible. Amen. And ladies, this is how we keep order in society. Because, let's turn to chapter 11 of 1 Corinthians. Verse 3. But I want you to know that the head of every man is Christ. Write, write that down on a piece of paper. The head of every man is who? Christ. Christ. Okay. The head of every woman is Write that down right under Christ. And the head of Christ is now put God over Christ. This is the divine hierarchy of headship. God, Christ, man, woman, children. But I know what you're saying because I've heard all the I've heard all the rationale. Well that was back then. Hold tight. Every man praying, verse 4, or prophesied has, having his head covered, dishonors his head. But every woman who prays or prophesies with her head uncovered, dishonors her head, for that is one and the same as if her head was shaved. In biblical times, having your head covered was a symbol of being under authority. So that's why it was disgraceful for a woman to have her head uncovered or to have her head shaved because it denoted that she was one, a woman who was not under authority. So the issue is not where you should wear hats in church, the issue is this is a symbol of what? Submission and authority. And it's not cultural. It's creative. It's based on creation. Watch this. Verse 8. For man is not from woman, but woman from man. So men, don't be dogging women because there would be no men if there were no women. Because they none of you men having no babies. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so women have a role. They have a very important role. They have a vital role. Without them, mankind would cease to exist. Nor was man created for a woman, but woman for man. For this reason, a woman ought to have a symbol of authority. See, it's a symbol. The head covering was a symbol of authority, of being under authority on her head because of the angels. Nevertheless, neither is man independent of woman nor a woman independent of man in the Lord. We need each other. But we need each other in our proper what? Roles and positions and functions. Mm 
For as a woman came from man, even so a man also comes through woman, but all things are from God. So, this is the divine hierarchy. God, Christ, man, woman, children. That's not culture, that's based on creation. Listen, if God is over Christ, and Christ is over man, and man is over woman, and the man and the woman are over the children, but we're saying because of culture, we can now make woman over man, then that means you can put Christ over God. You can't do that. So if that don't change, these two don't change. But we're living in a culture where the children are running all the other four. We got the children over God. We got the children over Christ. We got the children over man. And we got the children over the woman. And the Old Testament, Isaiah chapter 3, says whenever the kids or people who have the characteristics of children start to run a nation, you know you are under the judgment of God. It also says in that text that if the women and the children are leading everything and are in authority, you know you're under the judgment of God. The United States is a nation that is under the judgment of God because with the previous election before the last election, your choice was Hillary, a woman, and a petulant child, Trump. Oh, this is better than what y'all looking. <laughs> I'm trying to tell you what's going on. See, I'm not Marvin Gaye. I ain't singing the song, What's Going On. I know what's going on. Because the Bible knows what's going on. It's God's history book. It knows the past, the present, and the future. While well, time is gone, we're going to pick up here next week. I think I've given you enough to grind your teeth at, pick up some stones at, say I want to hear more, or you need to get saved. Or you can say, thank the Lord. Thank the Lord. Father, we just thank you so much for this opportunity and this privilege to share these truths with your people. Give us a heart and a passion and a vision for the community, the urban context you've called us to, whether we work there, whether we live there, whether we worship there. We have a mission to fulfill. And if we don't do it, it won't get done. Burden your people that are here tonight. Burden those who have listened by live stream. Help your leaders to guide and lead the people according to your will and not theirs. Empower us by your spirit because we can't get it done with human effort. Thank you for all your love, your patience, your mercy. Thank you for choosing us. And having chosen us, shaping us and molding us into the image of Christ day by day. While the other man, other man decays, we are being renewed inwardly day by day. And we thank you for these truths, these realities. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.